So that's uh, actually just a side effect. I didn't really think it would actually be screened or even posted to YouTube. Um, but here we are, and now it is. So um, it's interesting. Like, I know actually what to do. I think we all know what to do in order to get a lot of hits on YouTube, to get a popular video onto YouTube. So what I would have done if I were to make this a popular video would be I would probably um, hire an actor. I would, ha it would be probably a young woman, she would probably be wearing a bikini, and I would have taken her into this same location, which happens to be a car wash. This is a found situation that I happen to find extremely beautiful and sublime and kind of very oddly sexual in a way. So um, I, I would have taken this scantily clad woman and I would have sprayed her with the foam in the car wash you know and it would have been dripping off of her body and this would have made a successful work of art on YouTube but it wouldn't have satisfied my interest in the subject matter so um, but it is like a subtle confession and something that's almost sensational but not really right so, so perhaps at this point we can open it up to if anybody has any comments about curating YouTube, the difficulties, the pros and cons, how do you actually curate something meaningful, you know, on, on YouTube? Do you want to stand, mm -hmm. stand up for okay. responding? Has anybody got um, a response to that or any ideas or, have, I mean, have you seen any artworks on, on YouTube that have, transcended the medium of YouTube, in a sense. Yeah, please. I, I don't know if you're, are you familiar with these uh, lectures on relational aesthetics and conceptual art that are done by Hennessy Youngman, which is a guy who's sort of taking, not, um, uh, uh, like, what's the guy's name, Sasha, the, um, yeah, Sasha Baron Cohen approach to, interviews and to lectures and he does this incredible lecture on relational aesthetics so it's it's really obvious that it's an absolute joke it's completely sensational but you it, it feels sincere to the point where he actually fools a lot of people that look at these things I mean it's obvious a kid has an MFA and he is very very clearly versed in in um, theory and he's very steeped in critical theory but at the same time he has created this um, very light-hearted uh, ghetto dude persona that is completely making fun of the art world and the art world fucking loves it that's the weirdest part about it everybody is completely eating it up and loving it because it um, does point to the failures of the ivory tower in so many ways. So I, I, that is one, and that it's also a confessional structure. Sort you of know. like conflating Benny Hill with the doyens of the contemporary art world. Yes, like yes, Chris yes. And yeah. Matthew Higgs and so on, who are phenomenal and wonderful and fantastic, but I think it's, it's important not to take ourselves too seriously sometimes. It gets in the way of creating art or expression. Or presenting it. Yeah. Um, and then there's, uh, there's some German dude who also makes fun of conceptual art and contemporary art by process videos where he uh, lights, he spray paints some um, cardboard and then, or maybe some canvases and then lights firecrackers on them creating these residual images and talking about how this is what you need to do to make a successful work of art. And he always has a bag over his head, hmm. like a plastic bag and sometimes he has ears, sort of bunny ears and things like that. And he also employs like naked people in it. Um, and so mostly the successful videos that are communicating information about contemporary art that are not lectures or something are generally just taking the piss. And that's mm -hmm. what people like Refreshing. to see on YouTube. Yeah. yeah. 
One thing that Liz uh, said, or email, Liz Glenn emailed, was that nothing can replace the experience of sitting in a room together with other artists or an audience and watching something unfold. It's a very different, it's a very different experience to watch something live versus watch, watching something you know, on YouTube by yourself in your room. Um, the other thing that she was mentioning was that watching something on YouTube is always going to be a presentation. It's always going to be a form of documentation because you're choosing when to watch it. It's um, and when to turn it off. And when to turn it. Yeah. At it, what stage to turn it? When something's live, you, you can't you really. No choice. You can't really walk away. Even no. a lot of times you're a captive audience and you just have to dig in your heels and grit your teeth and sit right. and watch and process the experience regardless of how tedious it becomes. So YouTube, if anything becomes tedious, even for a second, you just turn it off and go to yeah. the next thing. Yeah, that's the second, yeah. Right, so uh, that's, that's what I mean about impeding the presentation of a serious work of art, which is not necessarily, that's funny, um, yes, yes. <laughs> which is not necessarily the, the, the most thrilling thing in terms of yeah. real time processing because right. you're, you're watching something unfold that takes some time to process and it, it might be very simple action and watching a simple action on a tiny television screen is quite is not very satisfying well I think we probably exceeded the patience of <laughs> patience of our audience on YouTube so if there's any other questions uh, from the audience any questions whatsoever anyone have a comment about how, how to curate a great show on YouTube yes Anna. I think it's sort of hard to have a work of art exist as art on YouTube because we're not really conditioned to take um, things on YouTube as seriously as you might need to to really um, understand and appreciate all the complexities of meaning that there might be in a work. And like you said, when you're in a room, you're you're thinking of it in a you're thinking of the discourse that's going to happen afterwards. You're thinking about what there could be talked about with the other, these other people sharing the experience. And on YouTube, I think we're just, nobody does that. Um, so that's exactly, yeah. So I think that's why it's, it's hard without the, the, YouTube is not the right frame so far to have work exist. It's interesting because uh, looking at Rhizome.com yesterday actually, um, because they actually deal with the internet space all the time as an exhibition site. And seeing that somebody had actually put together a very interesting show um, using email. So they had um, used email as a site in which to distribute a number of different artworks that um, from the Rhizome site or you know, the, the archive of artworks that Rhizome has and placed it for a limited time in people's email boxes. So you signed up if you wanted to be part or if you wanted to be part of this exhibition. So I thought that was a very interesting strategy and quite an effective one and something that I certainly would like to sign up for if it was still going. Because you could also choose, oh, I don't, I'm not interested in this anymore and, you know, delete it or put it into your junk file. So it, you control the duration of the show to some extent. So I thought that was an interesting way of using the internet space. virtual experience, it can never replace an actual experience with an actual object. Right. Like, I, I recently saw an NEA survey saying something like 80% of Americans' cultural experiences are, are um, vicarious via the internet. Yeah, it, which is a huge, huge amount, which means that people are looking at works in museums, permanent collections on the internet, but not necessarily going to the museum to see the works, which are two absolutely divergent experiences. They couldn't be more different. To, to be with a work of art and all of its physicality and materiality provides such a vastly different experience, such a vastly different energy just in the space with the objects and your body ambulating around these objects and considering them from different angles or different purposes. So I think that um, the, while the internet is the future of cultural experience, it's uh, completely insufficient. It's amazing, actually. That's a good way to end. Oh, sorry. I think it's also that um, when you're 
when you see an artwork in either a gallery or museum that it's it has a certain preciousness or rarefied quality about it because it's either sanctioned by some professionals like either the curator or you know the, the gallery owner or something so somehow it it's imbued with some kind of value and preciousness which um, you know affects the viewer and how they perceive it and how they yeah. relate to it whereas um, something that's seen on YouTube you know because anybody can put anything on YouTube there's no like filter there's no kind of um, guidelines or values um, associated with so people kind of it's not it's seen as um, transient and not necessarily um, value valuable you know even though it could be it could be so yeah it is very egalitarian that would change the conversation, if, if at all.